From Content360, this is the state of client acquisition. Right, welcome to this training about alpha selling. Who is this presentation going to be for? It is for people who don't have much experience in selling, mainly, first and foremost. Uh, this is also if you are mainly dealing with inbound requests or referrals. There's a big, big difference whether you are talking to somebody who is actually coming to you upon uh, inbound or via referral, or whether you are actually talking to somebody who you started the conversation with, for example, via prospecting. There's a huge difference, and it's usually much, much harder to convert the people who are uh, whose sources are upbound. Also, when you don't have a structured approach to selling, very much people are you know, sometimes doing it in a haphazard way. And if you don't have a process or some kind of a framework to it, then this pro training will be very, very good for you. Also, if you don't convert at least 20% of your sales calls after you've qualified, and what will you get out of it? First of all, the structured process, right? I'm very big on structure and following a, a framework, so this will be really useful for you. And also a very liberating mindset framework. I used to be very apprehensive myself of selling. And when I learned what I'm going to be teaching you now, things completely changed for me. I started to positively enjoy sales calls, always looking forward to them because of the framework of the mindset uh, approach that I have adopted. And very specifically, I, you're going to learn the nine principles for alpha selling. Okay, let's go right into it. Oh, before we go, uh, quickly, my stats for 2021, 170 qualifier calls. So those are the short, I call them the qualifier discovery calls, 15 minutes usually, and then those turned into 75 sales calls and that turned into 30 clients. The percentages are listed. It's 44% and 40% on each of those stages. Now, when we look at these, these two different things, there's very often like a different approach between sales and enrollment. Sales is the classic um, Alec Baldwin, Glengarry, Glenn Ross, type of approach always be closing you know it's very confrontational you want to convert them and you're treating them as prospects leads and numbers and so on all of that and you try to handle objections it's a very combative approach and it's especially in b2b especially in the post pandemic world it seems to be working less and less at least i maybe it's just a coincidence of my own evolution i used to be much more like this and then I went the other direction and I went into what is very often phrased as enrollment by the, I call them hippie capitalists, you know, people who are just very nice and friendly and it's all very warm and, and gentle. And that is mainly focused on things like exploring. Is there a fit? Removing doubts. It's very collaborative. It's very giving. You know, you answer questions and so on. And I don't want to knock that. That is definitely a better approach. From these two, enrollment is a much better approach to take. But what I found, and this is after doing many hundreds of sales calls, I have found that the good uh, balance between these two is in the middle. And I call it alpha selling. And when I say alpha, I don't mean anything you know too hostile or aggressive. I simply mean uh, an alpha is somebody who seeks out to do good by their followers. Somebody who is calm, determined, and unshakable. Somebody who has clear and ambitious goals, gets what he or she wants, uh, attracts followers, and doesn't quit. That is how I see an alpha. That is what I aspire to, to be. And the way of selling that I promote is always when you have this in mind, being a sort of like a benevolent ruler, a good leader. That is what an alpha is, and that is what I recommend uh, is the stance that you adopt yourself for when you are selling your products or services. So quickly, a definition, what is alpha selling? First, it is this art of separating the desired future state from an undesired current state and positioning yourself as the bridge between these two states and doing so confidently with a goal in mind, but without any pressure. That would not be alpha behavior, applying pressure, I think that the best uh, way, hi Stefan, good to, good to have you, hope you get something out of it. The best way to do selling is of course, when you are 
presenting the offer in a confident way, but when objections come, you don't take them personally. You don't try to kind of barrel your way through them and, and show up the other person. No, you are simply acknowledging that if objections come, you probably haven't done a good job. So that's what we're gonna be covering here as well. Let's now look at uh, visualizing the difference between these two states that we want to be discussing with our prospects on Zoom. You always have to think there are these two states. It's the current undesired states, the situation that they are in now, especially in my case, it would be, I don't know how to get clients, uh, getting clients is a haphazard process, there's no structure to it, there's no, no, no framework to it. And when clients come, sometimes it's this feast and famine situation. That is the current undesired state, but it's sort of fuzzy. They have a hard time putting a name on it. And then they also realize that there is a future desired state that they want to be, to be in. And the difference between these two is not very clear. They believe that, yeah, there's something I have to do differently, but it's not very clear on what that something is. And this is our job on a sales call to separate these two things clearly, to bring the current undesired state into a clear release, to make it abundantly obvious what are their problems and not this is not to tell them this is your problem and so on this it's very much to be to help them to understand what is their problem to make it very clear to them and to yeah make them make them see the light so to speak and then once you have brought that into their attention this is what we spend at least half an hour on when we are on a sales call to truly understand and explore their current undesired state and then we shift towards describing the future desired state. And that is, of course, by exploring the kind of the abundance that they will be in when they have been working with you. And that can, of course, apply to any situation, especially in B2B. Very often, we simply have a hard time articulating what the future desired state is. And we, we, we should work on that. When we have a prospect on the phone, we should be able to formulate what is the situation going to look like once we have been working together for a while? So bringing both of those things, the current undesired and future desired state into clear relief so that they see it. And then of course, is once we have done these two pieces of work, you position your product or your service as the bridge between these two states and the process, the means with which you get there is via alpha selling, which is the method that I'm describing here. Let's look at the alpha selling sequence. This is the structure of a call. I very much recommend that you adopt this, that you have a first a 15 minute screening call and then a 60 minute sales call. Let's look at the 15 minute screening call first. This is all about establishing rapport, a basic level of trust, which then moves into pain analysis. It's very important to distinguish between pain and problem on a sales call. Pain is if you look at an analogy with a doctor, pain is a stomachache. The problem that you have is an ulcer, but the, the doctor needs to still make a thorough analysis before they can give you their diagnosis that it is an ulcer. At this point, you only have the pain, okay? And the reason why this is, is because we don't want to presume too much. It's impossible on a 15 minute screening call when we also want to build rapport with someone to perfectly understand and to thoroughly summarize their problem. And therefore we only establish the pain, we explore it, we poke it a little bit. But once we have done that, we firmly establish, okay, this sounds to be, this it seems to be something that I might be able to help you with. Let's schedule a bit of a longer call, okay? So really try to make this distinction between pain and problem. Do not discuss the problem. For example, now we talked about the doctor, okay? This is not, it will not apply to many people here as we are mainly talking about high ticket, mostly B2B type sales. So let me give you an example of what it looks like in my world. Like for example, when you have someone who says that their team is not fully bought into the company strategy, right? You don't discuss what could be the reason for that. You don't discuss possibly poor leadership. You don't discuss the company uh, policy towards like employee wellness policies or anything like that. Those all could be the reasons, but we need more time to analyze that. Instead, you focus on the pain. You say, okay, 
So when your employees don't buy into your strategy, what does that look like? How can you tell? What are the telltale signs? That is exploration of the pain. You want them to become clear on what the, yeah, on what the pain is and what it looks like. Just like a doctor would ask to tell me, describe the pain. Where is it? Is it here or is it more there? Is it a, a pinching pain or more of a throbbing pain? What is it? That is the analysis you need to do on the 15 minute screening call. Cool. Hope that's clear. But it's really important. Okay. That's why I spend quite a bit of time on that. Then once you have an analyzed the pain, you briefly explain a potential solution with the clear caveat that you need to explore the problem more in depth when you are on the longer call. So brief explanation of the potential solution. And then we schedule the 60 minute enrollment call. And the 60 minute enrollment call is again about establishing rapport. Always good to do that right from the start, again, in each of those cases, in each of those calls. Then we get into problem analysis. This is now where we will ask so many questions about their pain that we are able to confidently conclude that this is indeed the problem. And once we've done that, we go camping. We really are discussing the problem at length, in depth. For example, in, in the case of the employees not buying into the strategy, what would be going camping, we would see, okay, so it's probably a leadership issue. The leader is not compellingly communicating the strategy and people would be buying into if somebody else did that. So it seems that our problem is we need to replace the leader or coach them to become better at that. We've identified that this is the problem. And then we go into, well, how could we do this? What are the processes of replacing the leader? In this example, we present the suggested solution. For example, we would say, okay, we have a solution where we can train up your CEO to improve in this area and we can improve their leadership skills. For example, somebody doing leadership training, this would be a suggested solution. And there's questions, then we discuss investment, and then we close and ideally take payment right there on the call. So that's the alpha selling sequence. Now let us look at the principles for alpha selling, stuff that has really helped me to become clear on how I should sell all the reframes that I've achieved over the last couple of years as I've been selling to strangers successfully. So first of all, it's, I'm a sifter, not an alchemist. I'm gonna quickly whiz through them and we're then gonna go into much more detail. So first, sifter, not an alchemist. The 50 minute call is for sifting, the 60 minute call is mainly for enrolling. If I invite you on the call, we will follow my agenda. Point number four, my time is valuable. Point five, I'm earnest and sincere. Point six, I never want to sell more than the client. Point seven, if I don't enroll someone I can help, I have failed them. Point eight, I prefer to prevent objections than to handle them. And point nine, I always want a specific next step. Cool, let's get into them right away in much more detail. Cool. So I am a sifter, not an alchemist. This is a very good quote from Eugene Schwartz from his book, Breakthrough Advertising. Copy cannot create a desire for a product. It can only, and similarly, and this is my quote, my, my in, in, injection here, is that this equally applies to sales or enrollment. Okay. So selling cannot create a desire for a product. It can only, I'm back into the quote, I can, it can only take the hopes, dreams, fears, and desires that already exist and focus those already existing desires onto a particular product. And this is the salesperson's, Eugene Schwartz wrote, copywriters, in my case, this is the salesperson's task, not to create this desire, but to channel and direct it. So important. If a, the only thing you remember from this training is uh, is one thing. Just remember this one. You cannot create the desire. You have to take what is already there. And that alone will completely change your sales game because you will stop from trying to convince someone into being much more like an investigative journalist, trying to understand if somebody who you are talking to has indeed the problem that you can help them with. Okay, so this thing very important that you cannot create a desire, you can only amplify it or, or, or harness it or harness a pre-existing desire. 
So this is our goal in prospecting. Let's take a step back. Before we have actually gotten somebody on the call, we want to understand which of the following five categories, I'm sure other people have different, these are my five categories, a prospect is in. Okay, for example, in the at the lowest uh, level, it's they're not in the market. For example, it's not a, not a problem that you can help solve. They don't have big enough goals that you can help them achieve. And it's all about their subjective perception. Okay, so if they don't believe, if you believe that they have a problem, but they don't believe it, there's no way you will change their mind. Okay, you can try, you can raise awareness, and they can then over time gradually, and that's why it's good to have an email list, for example, gradually come to the conclusion that they indeed have a problem, but on the first call or when you are first talking to them and they believe they don't have a problem, there's no way you will be able to create that. Okay, so it's all about their subjective perception. When you find somebody like that, eliminate or ignore them in your funnel, by all means, put them into your, what I call the pot, which is the area where your currently non-in-the-market client should be. They get interesting content. They really appreciate them. It's sort of slowly simmering, stewing away, but you don't intend to convert them anytime soon. Okay, but you should eliminate them from your funnel or ignore them as potential clients. Then there's the time wasters who I would um, recommend to eliminate as well. Sure, they can go into the pot, but there are simply always a few people who don't really have an, uh, an interest in buying from you, but they will happily take your time in talking to you. So it's just a fact of life. We have to deal with it. Then, there's, then it starts to become interesting. Then there's a maybe later. There, I would recommend that when, as we, when we're talking on a, uh, on a sales call level, I would recommend that you reduce your time commitment, but of course, stay very friendly and get them on your email list. Then there are the prospects in power. They are a great fit, but they don't feel the pain strongly enough. And your goal on the sales call is to turn them into prospects in heat. And that is what the last group is. The prospects in heat, they're a great fit. They feel the pain. They want the goal. They are keen to work with you. Maybe they are hesitant of cost. And your goal is to close them, to work with them, to make them comfortable with working with you and make them believe indeed that you are the, the right fit for them. And the engagement in each of those five groups ends ideally in different places. So in the first group, they're not in the market, they're time wasters. Ideally, you could end that already on LinkedIn or wherever you're doing prospecting. Ideally, it ends on the phone when they are maybe later prospects in power or prospects in heat. In the last two cases, of course, ideally it ends with a close on your end. Okay, but this idea that it's like a set of pool balls and you're just shooting the white ball into them just to see where they go, this is a good frame of mind to adopt when you are doing sales calls. Okay, now I'm not an alchemist. I don't try to convince anyone. Let's quickly go through a couple of details on this topic. So trying to conjure up a sentiment, no, that doesn't work. However, and this is where the nuance comes in, this is where you will learn this over time, amplifying a latent existing sentiment, oh yeah, by all means, right? Somebody comes in is sort of, they have this uncertain view of their current situation. This is what we talked about when we said separating the undesired current state from the future desired state, by all means, that's a great thing. Challenging someone, oh yes, because it opens the possibility of the sentiment awakening. I've had that several times where I close people. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes when people come into a call not fully convinced, but you challenge them respectfully and you bring them over to your side, that is by all means possible. For example, you challenge them when they are factually wrong. For example, when they say you cannot get new clients on LinkedIn. I've actually had a person say that. Uh, when their mindset prevents them from succeeding. For example, or I never make decisions on the spot, something like that. This challenging someone respectfully, however, not trying to convince them, and yes, there is a fine line between these two things, but this has tremendous positive side effects for you. First, it's non-neediness, and also it's automatic authority and status. If you signal to a person that you don't need to sell, that you don't want to be selling them at all costs, right, that you can take it or leave it, that is so powerful because they, obviously believe that you, you're good at what you do, in that you don't need their money, very important, and at the same time, 
it signals to them that, they, that you are a leader, right? Because a leader is always non-needy. You always see this with people who are the true alphas in your life. They are never begging for attention. They are never trying to be the clown so that other people are like them and so on. They just never try to please. That is a wonderful place to be. And if you do this too much, if you do too much of trying to convince them and so on, you are effectively communicating that you are low status. Okay, let's look at the next principle. The 15-minute call is for sifting. The 60-minute call is for enrolling. Okay, why do we separate the phone calls into two sessions? Well, to save your and their time. You want to qualify them quickly. It also benefits from the second date effect. Now, this is a little bit politically incorrect, but when you are in the dating process, you are much more likely to get a kiss at the end of the date if it's a second date, okay? So when you are starting out the, starting out the, the communication with a prospective client, you ideally want to separate these two things so that in between the time they can think about you, they can look you up on LinkedIn or on your website and so on. So they have a really positive feeling about you so that then they feel when they meet you again for the second time that you that they already know you. Okay, and this will be reinforced by what I call the funnel lubricant. Okay, we'll cover that in a second. But to benefit from the second date effect, that's why we separate the sales calls. And um, also one of the reasons why we do this is instead of breaking off a 60 minute call after 15 minutes, which would be a little bit awkward, if you, after 15 minutes, you see they're not a fit, you would have to end the call, say, okay, I see we're not a fit, so goodbye. That would be a little bit awkward. Simply start out with a 15 minute call to begin with. You can always extend it. And I recommend that whenever somebody books a 15 minute call, you should at least keep the full half hour slot free so that you can go over. And if you cannot, if you have a too tightly packed day, at least do that. That should be the minimum. Ideally, I would say even give the full hour. The other day I had a 15 minute call, which turned into a two hour session, but we went really deep. And the, the person who I talked to seemed to be very appreciative of that. And I'm confident that we will end up working together one way or another. Okay, so that's that. If they turn, if the prospect turns out to be a prospect in heat on the 15 minute call, you can extend the call and enroll them, right? You should, I would say, always block 45 minutes after each 15 minute call in your calendar, if you can, at the very minimum 30 minutes. We also frame the 60 minute call as one that you will prepare for and add value to them. If you do that, it's also a good justification to only have a 15 minute uh, call in the beginning. And then also it serves as a, like a clear delineator. 100% of the prospects on 60 minute calls should be prospects in power or prospects in heat. You should ideally be able to eliminate the maybe later people. Because if somebody is maybe later, you don't want to do the whole song and dance. Actually, a sales call is really mentally taxing. You know, it's very exhausting because you're doing so much when you are talking to a prospect and you are doing a really good sales job. You're giving them a lot. Right? It's yes, of course, you are selling, so you are kind of generating revenue for yourself. So it's a it can be said that it is a bit of a selfish act, of course. But in the end, if you do sales calls well you really get to understand the person. You're a little bit, you're a mix of a therapist, salesperson, uh, and, and, and friend who tries to elicit and bring the best out of someone. So it is mentally exhausting. We don't want to be wasting our time with people who will definitely tell us maybe later, because if they are somebody who wants to work with us maybe three months from now, it's okay to have a friendly chat, you know, to give ans answer questions about what we do, how we work, maybe even pricing and so on, that's all fine. But I would not go through the entire process of what I'm describing here. It's simply not worth the time. Because if they say three months from now, it's much better to schedule the call three months from now, rather than trying them to remember what the sales call was about today, you know, three months hence. Okay, this is such a key thing. A lot of work is achieved before, between, and after the call. This is why there's an image of a foundation of a building, because if we have that, if we build the foundation of our sales calls well, it's going to massively improve the probabilities that the sales calls will be successful. Okay, so 
before, between, and after the calls. And this is what I call the funnel lubricants, super important concept. When we do outbound prospecting or inbound, we get, of course, people into a 15 minute call. That is the first step. If we do, if we go via inbound, I strongly recommend that you ask people a short survey. Yes, you should by all means have your calendar open. People should be able to book calls with you. But I recommend that you have a very short survey. By the way, you can go on michaelbohannes.com slash apply to see my own short survey. And then once they filled out a survey, they will get through to a five to 10 minute video. That is in my case, I recommend that you do that too. So that, that's an optional, so that when they come to this page, they can watch the video and learn a little bit more about you, but it should not be too you know, detailed, too overwhelming. Five to 10 minutes is a good length. And then they are on the 15 minute call. And between the 15 minute call and the 60 minute call, that is the main thing that has, and that has helped me to double my conversion rate on sales calls. That is the, I call it the call prep video. Between these two calls, there's one video that explains much more in depth how we work, what we do, and what a collaboration would look like. And very importantly, it contains a whole page on here are the reasons why you should cancel the upcoming call. And those reasons contain things like if you are not ready to make the decision now, if you don't have any budget for it, if you don't, in my case, have 10 hours that you can invest in this per week so that we can end up working together, right? So those are all things, all the qualifiers that you put in front of them so that they, they should be canceling those calls, the 60 minute call, if they don't fit all the criteria. Before you have this call prep video, you can check all these boxes, the minimum qualifiers on the 15 minute call, but you can do both. Initially, when you, when you don't have a call prep video, you do it on the 15 minute call. And when you have the video, you can do it on either or on both. And by the way, if you wanna see my um, call prep video, I'm just gonna put it here in the comments. It's michaelbohannes.com slash call prep. Let me just find the mouse. I'm just gonna put it here. Um, call prep. Let me check this out. Good. Now, then once we get to a 60 minute call, there's three options. First, they tell us they need to think about it. So it's a bit of a maybe. In that case, I recommend as a funnel lubricant, a quick follow-up call that you schedule, let's say a week from now, and an email sequence that is meant to alleviate or counter their current objections. So when they say I need to think about it, it's not the time to start challenging them on it, but it is a good time to uh, ask them, where are your doubts, right? In which area are your doubts? And then based on that, you create an email sequence that then um, kind of tackles those specific doubts. And you should have a couple of email sequences like that scheduled and, and, and built and created for those specific use cases. It's going to grow over time gradually. I currently have two for two scenarios for two different personas, and it's going to grow as I'm getting more information uh, from my, uh, yeah, from my sales calls, what kind of objections at the end of a call, when I've made them an offer and they still say I need to think about it, I want to know what their objections are so that I can counter them in the email sequence. And all of those things, the more of these blue things here you do, the short survey and the five to 10 minute video, the call prep video, the email sequence, all of that will greatly overall increase your conversion rate. It's not going to make a big difference on any individual case, but in aggregate, as you then look back over your past year, you will see a considerable improvement in all of your metrics. Okay, so that was now the, at the end of the 60 minute call, it can be, and I need to think about it. It can be a close, which is great, or any other recurring hesitation, right? In that case, you, in these cases, you always schedule a follow-up call and you can do this simply, okay, listen, no problem at all. But in the interest of both of us, I recommend that we schedule a very quick follow-up call. You can take all the time that you want. Would it be okay a week from now? Yes, yes, okay, good. Just 15 minutes, let's put it in the calendar. And tell me where are your doubts? You know, I completely understand you wanna think about it. Uh, you wanna sleep on it. I don't want to rush you into a decision now, but what are your doubts and objections? 
And they tell you, they're very open. If you treat them respectfully, they will treat you respectfully back and they will tell you their objection. And with that, overall, these fun lubricants have greatly helped me to, to improve my conversion rate. Okay, now let us look at, and this is such a, wow, this is such a great concept that I, and that I learned over time. It's a gradual process. You sometimes always get these little setbacks, but overall it has been a masterful uh, progression that I underwent, of course, with the help of many mentors that I worked with. But it's the idea of, if I invite you on the call, we follow my agenda. This is about frames. This is about being, this is about like the essence of being an alpha. So I'm really looking forward to covering this now. So have you ever had this kind of person on the phone who tells you in this scenario, you are John. So they tell you, hey, John, so how are you doing? So listen, I wanted to talk to you because I'm interested in what you're doing. And can you tell me a bit about your background, what your product or service is and how you work and what it would cost, you know? Sometimes they even say, and I had that, I remember that some, somebody told me once, you have 15 minutes to sell to me, go. <laughs> and at that point, I was quite early in my process, but even I understood at that point that, hey, I, this is not going to stand. I told them, I, I, I'm not going to be selling to you. I'm here to ask a few questions. And if I think that we're a fit, I'm going to make you an offer. It's as simple as that, but I'm not here to, to sell to you. Okay, is that all right? And if you say that, they say, yes, okay you have totally won this little power struggle, okay? And this is about frames, briefly. What is it? A frame is a mental structure that shapes our way of seeing the world. Every human interaction has frames colliding and the stronger frame wins. You see this very much with charismatic people. And alphas are very good at imposing frames via choice of topics, tone of voice and body language, the time constraints that they impose. They say, okay, I have five minutes, they, then they dictate the agenda by being persistent and also, for example, your frame, this will be a great enrollment call. Even if I don't sell, we will connect on a human level. If you have that frame in mind, when you enter a sales call, that is brilliant. You've already won. Their frame, however, could be, I just want to know how they package their service and what it will cost me. If that is how they want to run this, then these two frames will collide. There's no way how these two frames can, can coexist because if it's all about just how they package their service and what it's going to cost me, this will take two minutes. You know, that, there's no point in having actually a call about this if this is something I could describe in an email. So, however, it's important to note that both of these are valid frames to have. None of them are wrong in any way. It's just that people want different things from an encounter. So who will win? Whose frame will win? Well, the person who is better at imposing their frame. And frames collide, right? So when the prospect tells you, so I'm curious what you're doing. Can you tell me about yourself, what you do and how much it'll cost? They come from the place of I'm the guy with the cash. So I'm going to ask a question here. And then you is, I will ask a few questions. And if there's a fit, we can talk about how I can help. That is your frame. These two frames collide. They cannot coexist. If you oblige, if after that question, so what do you do and how do you work? If you dutifully answer that question, you say, well, I've been an accountant for over 20 years and I've set up my own accounting practice. I mainly work with small businesses and my day rate is blah, blah, blah. You have lost your frame. Your frame is gone and they have won and you are very, very unlikely to close the deal. I can have done many of these kinds of calls. Every time I was in the seat of being questioned where they wanted to ans get their questions answered, I think I did not a single time close the sale. I'm not saying that you will close the sale if you kind of try to impose your frame, but at least you can walk out of it not feeling defeated. That is a very key, key thing. I now I'm wondering if there was ever a situation where I turned such a situation around. I don't think there has been, but it's important that because these things are on a sliding scale. It's never like a pure, you know, alpha type, you know, type A personality who's trying to impose themselves, but people are testing, you know, they are, they are dabbling in, in going into imposing their frames. And the better you are at countering these tiny little intrusions in your frame setting, the better you will be. And I'm sure there has been situations where I had a, you know, like a, quite a you know, charismatic person on the other side who were asking me questions. And I, by being good at imposing my frame, was able to counter that and to close them. 
it was never these hardcore people who said, ah, so what do you do? Sell to me. That never, you can never turn that around. However, the sort of middle ground cases, you can. And that is if you understand this concept, okay? So you need to prevail. And for example, when somebody tells you this, okay, right, sell to me, what, what's your service? You say, hey, honestly, uh, Tim, that's great to hear that you're interested in what I do, but if that's okay with you to keep the call productive, I suggest I ask you a few questions about your business first, if that's okay with you, and then we can cover how I could help. Is that okay? You always ask for approval and they, oh, okay, sure. Then you have imposed your frame and their frame is gone. Okay. Similarly, you need to be in control of the whole call, but also watch where your wish for control is coming from. A good place of origin for a healthy sense of control is I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste our time. You know, be respectful of the other person. And if I cannot answer my, if you cannot answer my questions, it's not going to be a good use of our time. Also, it's a good place to say, I'm a cool, calm expert. I know the best way to run a call because I've done so many of them. I will guide my prospect down the path that will be best for both of us. I smile at their attempt to dominate the call. They're like a rowdy kid in a supermarket who doesn't know how to behave. So let's find out if they can be taught or if they are irredeemable. And if they resist my gentle assertion of control, I will end the call. So those are all good places of origin of wanting to control the call. Bad places of origin is visceral emotional responses about their chutzpah of speaking to you in this way. Can you believe the gall of the guy asking me for free advice? If you're coming from that point, not a good place. Another bad place is any unresolved issues from childhood where you were the underdog and now you want to show the world that you're the top wolf, not a good place for a sense of control. I'm going to dominate you, or I really need this revenue, or this is so annoying, I keep having leads who, run the, who wants to run the call their way. In summary, any, any form of attachment to the outcome are bad places of origin. Okay, next principle, the calls need to have a structure. Remember, we have the structure, the 50-minute screening call, the 60-minute call, what are the individual steps there? Now, I'm not a big fan of using scripts, but I think for beginners, they are very, very useful. Even to a point where you have the script, I recommend that you split your screen, that on the left side, you have the script, and on the right side, you have the Zoom window, so that you can just you know look across the screen to find the next good line to say. Initially, that's important. I don't use a script anymore. I've done enough sales calls at this point that I kind of know the structure instinctively. But it's good to, to have a crutch in the beginning if, in, if the alternative is that you are just completely flailing around in an unstructured way. It's better to think of the script, not as a script, but as a framework. So if you're only listening to this, there's like these, I have these two frameworks, two kind of like step by step, what should be ticked, which boxes should be ticked in every call. So just going through it in the 15 minute call, it's preparation, rapport building, agenda agreement, pain questioning, future objection preventers, a summary, an overview of what I do and lead into the next call, what's in it for them, book the call and so on. All right, so that is a good structure for a 15 minute call. Once you have done this several times, you will automatically know this and therefore it's good to have a framework so that you know which step is next but you don't need to read anything out from a screen that usually is, you know, it can be heard on the other side that you are reading this and with that you, you lose authority, you lose rapport. Next principle, my time is valuable. I really recommend you minimize the time investment for the people who are not in the market, who are time wasters and who are maybe laters. There is of course a temptation to be nice and to give free advice. Some people want that. It's also a temptation to sell to people who have not yet qualified themselves to be suitable. There is also a temptation to answer questions about ourselves uh, as discussed in the discussion of the frame. Now, how do you remedy this? Well, let's say your time is worth $300 an hour. If you have someone unsuitable on the phone and you are about to spend another 10 minutes with them, let me ask you, would you give them $50 in cash right now as a gift? Probably not. If not, then get off the phone. It's as simple as that, okay? Learn to value your time and see any additional time investment into someone who is never gonna be a client for you 
trust your gut on that and end the call as soon as you can. You can do much more valuable work just by whatever, doing prospecting, creating a new piece of content than by spending time with somebody on the phone who is not worth it. For the people who are not in the market and time wasters, end the call ASAP. You can give one sentence answers, but keep it friendly. You may be wrong after all, you wanna keep it friendly, but keep it, you know, end the call. With the people who are maybe later, again, similar to the above, but slightly less abrupt, whatever, you can give three answers, three sentence answers, not one sentence answers. And if they ask for free advice, if it can be done in a couple of sentences, by all means, give it. But if it requires more time, you can say something like, sorry, John, this is something I normally charge for. If you're interested in a consultation, I'd be happy to set one up for you. Or you could also, and I recommend this, I've done this uh, several times now, where you give people a free consulting call that is recorded that you can then turn into a podcast. You will come across well when you are uh, giving free advice. You can use that for video clips for your content. That's all great. Just make sure that you don't do this too often because after you have a business to run. Then sometimes I get the question, well, shouldn't we, we be generous first? Should we give before we receive? I follow this rule of thumb. I give value only when I'm broadcasting. So you add value in one too many broadcasts, videos, posts, articles, webinars. People can learn a lot from you in this way. But in a one-to-one -one scenario, the only time when you are willing to add value is when they seem like a genuinely closable prospect. Even if it's in the future, that's fine. Just do it. Um, you know, be, be judicious with your time. That's how all the greats do it. And I would recommend that you impose it mercilessly, but without any emotion, especially no huffing and puffing about the chutzpah of the prospect that they ask you for free advice. Just move on. Next principle, I am earnest and sincere. It's really easy to be cynical in sales, especially when you are already successful. So I would recommend that you avoid being blasé or arrogant or cynical, looking down on the prospect, having a cookie cutter approach to each call. That is a very easy temptation when you already know what you're doing. Instead, have the idea of helping people as your goal instead of revenue goal. If you help people effectively, the revenue will come anyway. Before every call, I recommend that you reaffirm your commitment that you aren't here to make a quick buck, but you're looking for people that you can get great results for. Also become conscious of your prejudices of the prospect and let go of them. Very important, remind yourself to not make any assumptions on the call. Instead, you will ask for every piece of information that you need. Never make assumptions. It's one of the deadliest things that breaks rapport. Uh, instead, ask for every single piece of info. Next principle, I never want to sell more than the client. You should never want to enroll anyone who is not a great fit with you and who you cannot help get great results. Remember, you're a sifter, not an alchemist. You cannot conjure up a desire. You can only see if the person has one and possibly amplify it. You also get a ton of respect when you don't try to close anyone who's not closable. I actually believe at least one case where I told the person on a call, I don't think you're a fit with me. And they asked, like, why? And I said, well, because you seem to have, you don't have a problem in this area. So I think, I mean, we can chat, but I think that actually you don't have a real problem. And then they kind of were like, wow, they realized that I was not attached to the outcome. And then we ended up working together, right? Because I had this non-needy approach to my, to my sales. When you do this, people also start to qualify themselves to want to work with you. Change your language. I recommend that you go move from sales to enrollment, at least if you have been stuck so far in a place of, oh, sales, I need to close them and then, then always be closing and so on. Move more into the enrollment phase. I needed to do that. I was very much into the oh, close them. Then I moved into enrollment and then I settled on this healthy balance between these two that is alpha selling. Um, instead of lead gen on LinkedIn or finding clients on LinkedIn, it's simply finding people I can get great results for. Instead of price or cost, say investment. And also change your KPIs away from your revenue towards number of people helped, revenue that my clients generated, and so on. Okay. Uh, and also never be afraid to lose a prospect. As soon as you become fully prepared, genuinely and really properly prepared to lose a prospect, they will start coming to you. So the earlier you can make this change that you don't mind losing somebody,
the more you'll get. If, if the famous saying is, if you love someone, set them free, they will stay with you. This goes as far as rejecting applicants with the wrong mindset. I actually had this one person who told me, um, the, yeah, you have 15 minutes to sell to me. I did have the call with them, and then they actually said yes towards the end. But then again, they, they behaved a little bit inappropriately that I decided, you know what, I just don't want that in my life. I, I, can, I can afford to say no to this person because I just don't want to work with them. Very important that we reject applicants with the wrong mindset. And then another great principle is if I don't enroll someone who I can help, I have failed them. Very powerful frame to adopt. You have a duty to close a sale for someone who is suitable for your product or service. People are justifiably skeptical of people who sell. But you have extremely high ethical standards. You only enroll people who are a great fit and who you 100% know that you can help. If you don't convey this ability and your confidence that you can deliver good results to your prospect, you have failed them. They, by not working with you, will have a worse life than if they had worked with you. And this is why you need to become very good at sales and enrollment. You owe it to them. They want to be sold too well. After all, they have a problem. We have identified that. We have confirmed that. So just like you owe it to them to be extremely competent in what you do as you deliver to them, you owe it to them to sell them. Okay, And this is also the spirits in which we should handle their objections. Because deep down, they know they need the change that you can provide and that this is worth more than the money they will be paying you. But pain is painful. And so they will tell you half-baked, untrue objections that their lower self comes up with to protect the status quo. You know, it's also known as bias or liars. And by handling their objections compassionately but firmly, you are leading them towards what is good for them. Just like a personal trainer, you're giving them the final gentle push to take that last step over the ledge themselves. And if you don't handle their objections, well, again, you have failed them. Speaking of objections, the uh, next principle is I prefer to prevent objections rather than handling them. You know, it's the famous, I need to think about it. And these objections in most cases are really not true. You know, like I need to think about it. I need to talk to my wife, boss, co-founder, COO, yoga teacher, dog. You know, I don't have the money or budget right now. I'll have the budget in three months time. Let's reconnect then. Or it's a bad time of the year. All of that in most cases tends to not be true, or at least it's superficially true. You don't really understand why, and you cannot learn from it, therefore. Also, the majority of, the, of objections come down to these three. I need to think about it. I need to talk to partner. Or I don't have money or budget right now. And here's how you anticipate them. In a 15-minute call, verify when they could start, how big a problem it is, and if there's other decision makers. You can do that on the 15-minute call or in the funnel lubricant video, which we covered before. Invite them to reschedule. Number one, if they are not ready to make the decision now, to bring important partners along and to reschedule if they don't have the budget. And if you've done that and then they still give you objections, simply accept what they say, but ask for feedback. I would recommend you never apply any pressure and Alpha does not pressure anyone into buying. Also, don't try any gimmicks. I used to recommend the so-called action taker discount saying like, oh, it's 10,000, but if you pay now, it's 5,000. Nah, it's just like, it sucks. This just, uh, it, it's, not, it's, not a good, it's, it's not a good look. You know? And if they say no, you haven't done your own job properly. You know, when you have failed them, it's fine. It keeps happening. It happens the majority of the time for me, but you haven't done your job properly if they say no. So accept that, accept responsibility for that. Let go of the sale and now seek to understand so that you can learn from it. And finally, last principle of alpha selling, I always want a specific next step. Every call needs a specific outcome. It's a frequent mistake to leave the outcome of a call open, such as, okay, great, thank you, I'll think about it and get back to you. It does not give you any other option than sending weak, needy follow-ups every couple of weeks in the vein of, oh, did you have a chance to consider my offer? sucks. Nobody wants to do that, so don't do it. And, and the no is preferable to a maybe. The acceptable outcomes for a 15-minute call are 
one or both sides conclude that there's not a fit or a scheduled 60 minute call in our calendars or a non-scheduled agreement to have a 60 minute call if a third person will be joining ideally you could nail down the new appointment then and there but it could happen so that's at least that and if they don't schedule then you know you lost that sale the acceptable outcomes for a 60 minute call are one or both sides conclude that there's not a fit number two it's an immediate close however you define that but best if it's a virtual handshake and payment or a quick follow-up call when they want to think about it if they want to think about it and the very specific next action for example getting the ceo on the next call scheduled for a specific day okay that's it uh, i don't have a final slide but i hope you got something out of this those are the nine principles of alpha selling most importantly just make sure that you have this mindset of you are like an investigative journalist you are not trying to convince anyone but instead you are sifting you're not trying to conjuring up a feeling for them instead you are just trying to understand where they are and if they are in a situation that fits your expertise that you can help them you then make them an offer to invest with you okay and with that uh, very happy to stay on if there are any questions and if not i thank you so much for attending for listening i really appreciate that you gave me your attention for these 52 minutes it went a little bit longer than i originally wanted to but there's a lot to discuss so if there's no questions thank you very much the state of client acquisition is a content 360 production music by gavin knox grand to sign up for alerts and to submit written and audio questions, go to stateofclientacquisition.com. Come